Thank you so much for having me. Who was here this morning? We had a bunch of people. Most people were here this morning. So yeah, my name's Jamie and uh, I do this a lot. I work full time as, as well. And uh, as I was saying this morning, I had that time where I was, I was flitting between both. What is it, God? Is it ministry? Is it television? Is it ministry? Is it television? He's only ever said one thing to me about it because I always tell people both, just do both. And they go, but, but you get over it. It'll work out. Just start both. And, and, and I, I, I struggled with it for a long time. God, it's a television ministry. And he actually said to me only one thing. And he said, you are a minister. That's all he said. And I figured it out. I was like, oh, I thought it was a job. I thought it was a title, a sash, a scepter, a name tag. I thought it was, uh, do you get a sash, a scepter? I thought it was something like that. But a minister is somebody who serves up. We're called to be ministers of the Spirit. So a minister of the Spirit is someone who serves up the Holy Spirit, be it from behind a pulpit or in a cafe or writing a book or writing a story or speaking to someone we're called to serve up the Holy Spirit. So it's a good job. Can you be anointed if you're doing both? Lippin' hope so. Absolutely you can. I've said before, God, if you can't anoint me while I'm playing with the kids, don't bother. My God, if I put my family first and that doesn't put a smile on your face, God, then something's wrong, right? But God is amazing. So excited. Um, great. So we're doing in motion. Right, this thing. Um, I feel like this is holy ground tonight. I was sitting there and I felt like taking my shoes off. And I just got new shoes. I got them half price at Zara. And I was like, God, I was really happy with the buy. And, and I felt like, you know what I mean? Sometimes you feel like that. So if it gets weird, just bear with me. And I've never done anything like that. But anyway, that's the vibe I'm getting. Anyway, we're talking about in motion at the moment. And the picture I saw in my head just as worship was going on. Great job, Holly and the team. You guys are just amazing. And, and, and I saw these two rowboats going in the water. And I felt the Holy Ghost say, who wants to go? This morning, who wants to go? This message is called The Other Side. And I don't know if you're here this morning, that tonight and you're going, I want to go. I felt like the Holy Ghost saying, who wants to go? Who wants to go? Because I'll take you. Let's go somewhere. Because a lot of us have got to cry in our hearts for more. Oh, the beautiful John Wiggins and I, we've been ministering to each other in the car. We're going, who? I've got to cry in my heart for more. And I don't know what to do about it. It's just scary. And I feel like the Holy Ghost said, who wants to go. So let's start with the Scripture. The message is called The Other Side, Mark 4, 35 to 37. I've got to talk about this part first because I feel like this is important. Um, that day when evening came, Jesus was preaching on the side of a lake. That day when evening came, He said to His disciples, let's go to the other side. Ah, uh, I love it. Sometimes it's what Jesus doesn't say, which is just as powerful as what He does say. Because by Jesus saying, let's go to the other side, do you know what He was also saying? Let's leave this side because you've got to leave somewhere to go somewhere. I don't know if you figured that out before. And I had to leave Sydney to come to Brisbane. If I wanted to come to Brisbane, but I wasn't prepared to leave Sydney, oh, it wasn't going to happen. So Jesus is saying, guys, you've got to leave somewhere if you want to go somewhere. We were talking about that this morning. If you want contentment, you've got to leave comparison. If you want peace, you've got to leave anger. There's things you've got to leave if you want to go somewhere. And then it says, leaving the crowd behind, don't. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. It's a crazy thing. I'm going to call this first bit how to leave one side or how to leave a side. Jesus had this amazing teaching about anxiety. And in Matthew 6, 25, he said this, Therefore, I tell you, stop being worried or anxious or perpetually uneasy or distracted about your life. And this is the crazy bit that he said next. And he says, and who of you by worrying can add one hour to the length of your life or can add one cubit to his stature? A cubit is just like a small measurement, which is just, I've read it so many times and I finally had the courage to say to God, that's stupid. Who, who of you by worrying about your life can get Taller. I mean, that's a stupid thing to say. This is Jesus, God in the flesh. The Word of God become flesh. Who of you, by looking in the mirror and going, oh, I wish I was taller, wish I was taller, can actually get taller? Who can do that? Now, if I was sitting there watching, you know, listening to Jesus, real time a couple of thousand years ago, I would have, because I'm polite, clap my hands and gone, that is good. 
That, but deep down, I'll be going, that is stupid. And I've looked at it and I've thought, what? Jesus, I can't control my hype by worrying about it. And it's almost like Jesus is saying, aha, yes, you can't control what you can't control. He's talking about being perpetually uneasy, perpetually, like your mind is always worrying. This anxiety, he called it anxiety and worry. He said it's called perpetual uneasiness. The best way to describe it is what it says in the Amplified, which is you've got this constant distraction going on in your life. And Jesus said, because you can't control what you can't control. This is crazy. I love this. Um, I, I, I sometimes look at the old Stoics, these Greek philosophers. I'm mad on them at the moment. This guy, Epictetus. I pretend I know him, but I don't. I've just read one quote. Um, and it says this. He said this, the chief task in life is separating things that are inside your control from things that are outside your control. How's that? The number one thing, this guy, this Greek philosopher, he goes, I've figured it all out. The key to life is figuring what you can control and what you can't. Or in other words, trying to control the things you can't control will control you. That makes sense, doesn't it? This is crazy. I was watching a YouTube thing the other day and um, there was an expert on anxiety and this guy was interviewing him and, and he said, okay, I love all the stuff you're saying. It's really good helping people. It's really good. He said, we're going to a break. Can you give me something that people can do properly, like materially, that people could do right now practically that would help them with this perpetual uneasiness, this anxiety. And he said, okay, this is what I want you to do. He said, I want you to write down all the things you're worried about. And then I want you to put a line through everything you can't control. And I thought, that is absolute blooming genius. And I started to do it myself. And I started thinking about the things in my own life that I've been worried about that I've actually got no control over whatsoever. And do you know what the first thing that came up into my life was? Blimey, driving. I get, and, 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 and can I just say, driving in Sydney is a blooming nightmare. And it's not so much the driving, it's where to park when you get there. As soon as somebody says, well, it's a work do, and I go, where's dinner? And they go, it's in Darlinghurst. I'm like, no, oh, there's nowhere to park. I'll never find a park. And, and I had this driving over the bridge, about to go for a park, and I thought, there's not going to be a park. Is there going to be a park? And I thought, hang on a second. No, I'm putting a line through this. And I was going, I can't control it. Whether the, I know it seems like a menial thing. I don't know if there's going to be a park. There might be, there might not be. I can't control it. And then it got deeper for me and I started thinking about things in the past that have bothered me and made me anxious and that I've regretted and going over things. And it was like God saying to me, Jamie, you can't control this. It's gone. You need to take out a pen, write it down and put a line through it. Imagine how empty your head would be if you actually stopped being perpetually uneasy and distracted by things you've got no business thinking about because you can't control them. And then the next thing, which I think Jesus was talking a lot about here, is other people's opinions. Gosh, you can't control them. Somebody said a great quote to me the other day. They said, what other people think of you is none of your business. <laughs> you cannot control and never control what other people think of you. We're talking about leaving one side and going to the other because some of them, some of you feel like you've got a call on your life. You feel like you're built for something bigger. B, you've got this hold on your life and it's what other people will think if you actually step out and you actually go for it or heaven forbid, if you would actually fail, what would they do? Think of you. And I love what, what the Bible says here. When the Bible says this, it says, it says, it says, that day when evening came, he said to the disciples, let's go, let's go to the other side. And you can imagine the disciples getting into the boat, just a few of them in Jesus' boat, because Jesus said, let's go. The Bible actually said there was a couple of other boats that went. So not everybody went. And then the Bible says, leaving the crowd behind. 
So most people went, who do you think you are taking off? Just because Jesus has spoken to your heart and says, let's go to the other side. Let's do something bigger than we're doing here. How about we go and do something great? They've jumped in a boat and they've decided to go somewhere. Isn't that amazing? Leaving the crowd behind. And I don't know what you feel like God's called you to do, but you might have this war in your head of what other people will think of you and you've got to let it go. You gotta put a line through these people's opinions. Maybe some of you, it's been stopping you for years and years and years. And I was, as I was going over this, as I was going over this, it's crazy. I started to think about Mary and Martha because the Amplified Bible says this, it calls anxiety about what you can't control, being perpetually uneasy or distracted. And I thought about Mary and Martha. So Jesus shows up at Mary and Martha's place for dinner, right? And Martha's flat out busy and Mary's just sitting down looking at Jesus. And it's always bothered me this. And I thought, Jesus, it's not fair that you give Martha a hard time because she's flat out doing stuff and Mary's just sitting there. How on earth can you give Martha a hard time for being busy? And I was looking at it. But he didn't give Martha a hard time for being busy. It says this, it says, but the Lord replied to Martha. He said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered and anxious about so many things. Jesus wasn't unhappy because she was busy. This is cool. He was unhappy because she was distracted. What a crazy thing. You see, being busy won't affect God's presence in your life. And I know people talk about that. You're just too busy. You're just too busy. That's a problem. You can't have God's presence because you're busy. No, no, no. Being busy won't affect God's presence in your life. But being distracted will Because, and God spoke this to me this week, because I'm not looking for your hands. I'm just looking for your face. Isn't it crazy? And Martha's busy doing stuff. And he goes, I'm not looking for your hands. I'm not upset that you're busy, Martha. But Mary chose the right thing because I'm not after your hands. I'm after one thing and I'm after your face. I don't care if you're busy. Just don't be distracted. I just want to see your face. And when was the last time God saw your face? I thought of awesome dude, cap on, backwards in there in the middle. You're giving a yeah, you. And I felt like God said to you, I want to see your face. I really did. I felt like God said, I want to see your face. And I don't know. And you know what we're like? And we go, oh, no, 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 Jamie, I pray all the time. Oh, no, I'm not distracted. I'm praying. And we go into God and with all the stuff we can't control in our head. God, I pray for this. And I'm praying for that. I'm going to pray for this. I'm praying God. And God's like, hey, where are you? And you're like, yep, hang on. And I'm praying for this. Oh, sha da 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 Pray for this. And we get into worship. God, worship you. Worship you, God. Oh, Lord, pray you. Yeah, thank you, God. Everything's come to pass. And God's going, where, where's your Wait. Whoa. Stop. Where's your face? When was the last time you stopped being distracted by all this junk you can't control? In first place, just showing him your face. Because that's what he's after. Because he can do amazing things when you lift up and you show him your face. He can do miracles in your life when you show him your face. It's a scary thought, but, and I know I'm the same, and I, I, I hide back from God, and I don't do it. And he's like, Just show me your face. Show me your face. And here's the thing. You might not be Martha on the outside, but you might be Martha on the inside. And it's crazy. And he said that Mary chose the right thing. So maybe there's a choice in place here. And Mary's just sitting there going, I find when you actually do show God your face, your prayer goes from, oh, show da 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 to like, hey. It's a really dumb prayer. It just goes to, what have you been doing? It's just so simple. And it's so beautiful. And I pray above anything tonight that God brings us back to that place of simplification, of just having your face in His and not being distracted. Who wants to go to the other side? Let's do it. Let's do it. Leaving one side and let's go to the other. Next part that happens in this story is a storm. We talked about it this morning. It says a furious squall came up and we found out this morning that a squall wasn't actually a a bird. It was actually a storm, (laughs) a female seagull because they (laughs) sailed too close to a nest. But in fact, it was a storm and the waves broke over the boat so that was nearly swamped. 
And I look at this and it bothers me because there's a storm in the will of God. You can imagine the disciples going, gee, if we're really in the will of God, there wouldn't actually be a storm. Has anyone ever thought that? My life wouldn't be this messed up if it really was, if I really was in the will, the will of God. I think I must have missed the will of God. I don't know how I missed the will of God, but I must have missed the will of God because it's an absolute storm. It's a all funny, you know, it's that kind of storm. You know what storm I'm talking about? It's that storm. Like it's a bad storm. And not only is it a bad storm, it's a long storm, like a really long storm. And you can imagine the disciples, we've got not, a, you know, it's, it's okay, we've got God with us. Not only did they figuratively have God with us, they literally had God with them, having a sleep on a boat, in, on a cushion, balancing on a cushion, sleeping. It's like, how on earth can there be a storm in the middle of the will of God? Well, let me tell you, it's just a storm. You can imagine the disciples going through things and going, why is there a storm and picking their own lives apart? And Peter's going, actually, when Jesus was, was doing an altar call the other day, I, I, I did a micro sleep. It was a long altar call. And in fact, I actually look forward to his altar call so I can have a sleep. I know no one else does. And you know, and John going, actually, when I was in worship, all I could think about was lunch. And it's like, that you've got all these reasons why maybe there's a storm in your life. I remember 18 years ago, God told me to give 50 bucks and I didn't. That's why there's a storm. God told me to go to Bible college when I was seven and I didn't. And that's why there's this. We go through, oh, we got so many reasons. We got so many reasons why there's a storm. Do you know why there's a storm? It's just a storm. It's just a blooming storm. It's just a storm. Don't give up on what you know you've got in your heart and the dream you have just because it doesn't look right. It means flipping nothing. And I, I, and I mean this from my bottom of my heart. It's taken me a long time and God to figure this out, 30 years to figure out the storms mean nothing. Stop looking at it and going, well, this means God's saying this is God's saying Rubbish! The storms mean nothing. It's just a flipping storm. And, and if you would go, no, it's a demonic storm. If there was ever... Sorry to get so drunk, please. If there was ever going to be a demonic storm, this is it. This is the demonic storm. The devil's going, whoa, ho, ho. I've got Jesus, all the disciples in one place. Demonic storm, demonic storm. And she's like, nah, it's just a storm. Stop, carry it on. It's, it's just a storm. I think you've been over-spiritualizing this stuff. Can you just stop for a second, put a break on your mind, Trying to control things you can't try. Should've done this, should have done that, should've done this, should have done that. Do you know what? I had this thing, this financial thing I love sharing. I love to overshare when I preach because then I feel like God can, you know, make you feel normal as well. And I had this thing in my life. I blamed a storm that we went through for a long time, still sometimes go through a bit on a decision I made about 20 years ago. That's because of that. That's because of that. And I remember I used to go through in my head, God, if I had my time again, oh, I wouldn't have sold that house. If I had my time again, I would have done it different. I used to do it all the blooming time. And I found that I couldn't pray and believe for great things because I felt like it was my fault. We were in the hole we were in. Anyone else ever had it? So I could never fully engage my faith because nothing looked right and I felt like it was my fault. And I was, God, if I had my time again, God, thank you. Thank you for giving me wisdom, God. If I had my time again, God, well, if I had my time again, I would have done that different. We'd be far ahead, but that's all right. Walking through a storm, God. Eventually, I felt God speak to me. He said, if you had your time again, you'd do the same thing. Move on. I was like, oh, whatever. <laughs> He's rude, isn't he, sometimes? <laughs> like really rude. And do you know what? A similar thing happened. Do you know what I did? I did the same thing. And then I went, oh, shivers, I did the same thing. My wife wanted to shoot me, but I was like, anyway, let's move on. It's just a storm. Don't lose heart when things look wrong. Just because it looks wrong doesn't mean that it's not coming to pass. When I think about that, I think about Mary when things look wrong. Mary, Jesus on board. Saviour of the world on board. And it's like, going to go and have the baby. And her husband Joseph says, mm, just a heads up, we've got to go do the census. It's five days away on a camel. 
really cold because it is in the middle of winter there. And um, so she's on a camel, not a camel, what was it? Donkey, on a donkey, on a squall. And she's traveling on a donkey, five days. And you can imagine her expectation. She got the call of God on her life, right? Can you imagine her expectation of how it's going to go? She's like, this is going to be good when I get there. This sucks at the moment, but when I get there, it's going to be good. She gets there, she gets there, goes to the top, you know, six senses spa, knocks on the door. Hello, you probably recognise me, Mary. Got a little glow going on. And they're like, no room. She's like, Really? She goes, do you want to check again? Have a look on the books again. You sure there's no room? Have a look again. There's no room. It's like, really? No room? You can imagine she goes, and she slightly goes down. What would you have? Six senses. Maybe she goes to a Novotel. Still quality. Knocks on the door. Hello. I'm Mary. Come, maybe Jesus. Um, can I have a room? <laughs> no, we're full. It's like, really? Really? And it's like, oh my gosh, what's, what's next? An ibis or something knocks on the door. Is there a, I don't know, don't judge. And they're like, no, can't come in, can't come in, can't come in, can't come in, can't come in. I don't want to make it clearer than this, but no doors are opening. And you might have had that yourself. Not one door is opening and she ends up in a flipping barn, in a barn with animals around. Surely there was a part of her, surely there's a part of her that goes, You could have done something, God. Just a little. I feel like, God, that I had a dream and the opposite of what I thought was going to happen and what I prayed for has happened. Like this is an opposite situation that I'm in here, God. I think maybe a tiny bit in her head, just a little bit. So she has the baby in a barn. And I don't want to say it because I love you, Lord, but whatever way you look at it, she had a barn baby. That's a heck of a thing. This is the son of God. He's a barn baby. This is, and she must must have still reflected on going, really? Nothing happened? I said all that, squeezed all of that out to let you know that don't give up just because it really doesn't look right. Because I'm telling you, if it looks like the opposite of what it should, and I'm saying this storm, you thought it was gonna be six months? It's been 60 years. Don't give up on this thing. It's been a long time. You thought people were gonna be mean to you for two months? It's been eight years. You thought that person you're working with was gonna drive you nuts for a couple of days? It's been six months. Don't give up just because things don't look right at the moment. The storm means nothing. God is still doing stuff in your life. You with me? Turn to the person next to you and say, I think you're having a barn, baby. (laughs) It's scary, right? Yeah. Don't miss it because it doesn't look right. (laughs) Because some of you have got a cry in your heart for more. A cry that sounds like now, after it's been so long, it sounds like an unreasonable request. Oh, God put this on my heart so hard. I love talking about blind Bartimaeus, an unreasonable. Anyone ever feel like that? If I was to pray for it now, it would be unreasonable, God, for the type of person I am. Blind Bartimaeus. Then they, Jesus' disciples, came to Jericho. As Jesus and His disciples, there it is, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout. He said, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called the blind man. Jesus, blind Bartimaeus, here's Jesus. And he cries out, son of David, hey, hey, whoa, hey, hey. He cried out, I need a miracle. And then as he did that, the ministers, Jesus' pastors and ministry team said, wait there, Jesus, back in a minute. They come over and they go, shh, can you just be quiet? You don't understand how miracles work. 
This is the way it works. See, we're the ministry team. We're the pastors who encircle Jesus. We're the good people. We pray a lot and we do basically everything right. If He's gonna do a miracle, He's gonna do it for us first and you just shut up. That's basically what they said. That was basically what they, you shush. And then do you know what happened? They rebuked him and told him to be quiet. Gosh. But he shouted all the more. He shouted all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. And do you know what happens? The Bible says, Jesus stopped. God. He would have walked past. Dang it. He would have walked past. That's crazy. He would have, I'll tell you again, he would have walked past. I said he would have walked past. But there was something in blind Bartimaeus that was like, no, enough. I've had enough of where I am. I've had enough of this situation. I feel in my heart there's more. I've got to cry for more, God. I want more. And he cried out louder. Everyone told him to shut up. He had voices in his head, shut up. I've got to be quiet. Hey, son of David, have mercy on me. And they even came over, shut up. No, it's not your time for a miracle. And he goes, you know what? Stuff it. It is my time for a miracle. Today's the day. And he cried all the more. And he stopped God in his tracks. That's nuts. I don't even want to preach the rest of it. And you might be saying, yeah, Jamie, that's just one weird story. Jesus, you know, that's not how God works. Fast forward a bit, Jesus Talking about prayer, the disciples said, Jesus, how should we pray? And Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, let me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. Gosh. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The, the door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you everything I tell you, even though he would not get up and give you his bread because of his friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity. He will surely get up and give you as much as you need. An undeserving person like blind Bartimaeus with an unreasonable request at an inappropriate time. Like blind Bartimaeus, I'm undeserving. I got an unreasonable request. I want more. You know what I said what I wanted? I want more than that. It's unreasonable. I know it's unreasonable. I'm embarrassed asking for it. It's an unreasonable request and it's in an inappropriate time because I know you're going somewhere, Jesus. I know you're going to do somewhere. And Jesus, when He teaches them how to pray, this is crazy. He gives them the same blueprint. He talks about an undeserving person with an unreasonable request. Bread for a friend? Really? That's unreasonable. In the middle of the night at an inappropriate time. So Jesus saying, These are the prayers God likes. This is what the Father likes to hear. And I read this and I and I said to the Lord, but Lord, when teaching how to pray, why would you tell us a story about someone undeserving with an unreasonable request at an inappropriate time? And I felt the Lord say, Because it's not just someone, it's everyone. Ah! Because it's all of us. Because we all feel like this. We all feel undeserving. And we all feel like our requests are unreasonable. And we always feel like God's busy in Africa or something because He's got a lot to do. He's got a lot on His hands. He says, I know the way you feel. He said, these are the prayers I like. Come bold, come strong. Golly. You with me? Good. This is the prayer the Father loves. There's a cry in your heart for an unreasonable request. I know you're thinking, J.B., yeah, but that's just what happened to blind Bartimaeus and that's just Jesus teaching on prayer. Don't do another one, all right, I will. As Jesus was on His way, the crowds almost crushed Him and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind Him, touched the edge of His cloak. Immediately, her bleeding was stopped. 
Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, someone touch me. I know the power has gone out from me. I don't want to say what happened. I don't want to say what happened there. But she took a miracle without his permission. Gosh. Shivers. Don't. That's scary to say it, right? That's like Holy Ghost electric stuff. She took a miracle without his permission. An undeserving person with an unreasonable request. She spent all the money at an inappropriate time. Like she wasn't even, with an issue of blood, she wasn't even allowed to be out in public. She was risking her life for this at an inappropriate time. And she said, nope, not today. You, you don't walk past me today. I've seen you walk past a dozen times, but not today. Today I touch you. And today I'm taking my miracle. I'm taking my breakthrough. God, I've got to cry in my heart for something more. And it's not my fault. You put it in there. And I can't see you walk past another time, God. And I don't know what the cry is inside your heart to get to the other side. It might be for family. It might be for healing. It might be to be loved. I don't know what it is for you. It might be a dream. But don't let them walk past. Not again. Come an undeserving person with an unreasonable request at an inappropriate time. Don't let them walk past. You want more. You feel like you don't deserve it. But God wants to do it. I feel like He's got a smile on His face. Oh, I feel like He's got a smile on His face right here, right now. Saying, yeah, that's what I love. I want to pray for you here tonight. I feel the Holy Spirit here doing things and stirring people up for a new day and a new way. I don't know what dreams He's put in your heart. But I felt like He said to me tonight, let's get in the boat. Who wants to go? Who wants to go to the other side? It's a new day.